already won, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm doing another book tag, the Monopoly book tag, and this was created by the wonderful Run Right Reads. I will put a link to her uh, original video. And, uh, it, this is in honor of National Play Monopoly Day, which was on November 17th. I can't remember the last time I played Monopoly, but it's probably more than 30 years ago. Anyway, so the first one is Go, a book with Go in the title. And I have chosen The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley, which is a 1953, certainly early 1950s British novel that I studied as an undergrad and absolutely loved. And the opening line of this novel is famous. The past is another country. They do things differently there. And it's about a, a man remembering when he was a boy, uh, spending a summer on an upper-class estate with his school friend. He himself was not upper-class. And he ends up becoming a go-between between his friend's older sister, this upper-class young lady, and a tenement farmer or something living nearby. And he is passing the love letters back and forth. And it's quite wonderful. would love to reread it because I don't remember any more than what I just said. In fact, I had to get some of those finer details of that very brief summary from a quick scan of Wikipedia. But that first line I've never forgotten past is another country. They do things differently there. Two was one of the most challenging prompts, Community Chest, a book where a character only succeeds because of his or her community. Wow! I had to think long and hard, and it wasn't really until just before I started recording that I suddenly clued in on a book that I read earlier this year that I absolutely loved that was very much about a community, a very supportive community, and it's called The Women of Brewster Place, a novel in, in the form of short stories from 1982 by Gloria Naylor, who died earlier this year. And I did it on audio and absolutely loved it. And I guess I'm not sure that any of those characters succeeded in any conventional way. Uh, it's about a group of women living in an urban development complex called Brewster Place, and None of them particularly, oh, maybe some of the younger ones, are successful in a conventional sense, career-wise or whatever, but the sense of community is, is really quite wonderful and wonderfully drawn. I find that this kind of a topic, communities are usually portrayed negatively in most fiction, and as uh, somebody who's not much of a joiner uh, myself, I tend to seek out and appreciate and notice those stories. So there may be many other stories about communities that I'm not reading or not paying attention to. But I had a lot of trouble thinking about a Sean book that had a sense of community that was a positive thing. And this wonderful series of interlocking short stories, The Women of Brewster Place, definitely fits the bill. Number three, Income Tax, a book with a character who has a nine to five job. As Steve Donahue lamented in his version of this tag the other day. There isn't much modern fiction that's about people working conventional nine-to-five jobs, not in a way that foregrounds their actual job. So I would say some of the novels of Barbara Pym that I've read show working women. I'm not going to spend any time talking about them, but a short story by Mavis Gallant that I just read paints one of the most compelling portraits of the uh, office environment, and this would be from maybe the late 1930s, early 1940s in Montreal, about a young woman who is the first woman to ever be hired to work other than as a secretary, but she's actually working not as a secretary in this civil service office. And wow, what a fascinating story. It was written by Mavis Gallant in the 1970s and published in her one book of short stories that are set in Canada called Home Truths from 1981. The story is called Between Zero and One, and while it shows what a feisty character the protagonist, young Lynette Muir, was, and how she navigated the sexism and conservative atmosphere of this civil service office environment, I will share one paragraph that shows the seedier side because it's also a vintage 
made this gallant paragraph. It's actually uh, not even the full paragraph. Her paragraphs are usually a page and a half long. So this is about her er very early days or weeks on the job. Assistant Chief Engineer Macaulay came plodding softly along the wintry room and laid something down on my desk. It was a collection of snapshots of a naked woman prancing and skipping in what I took to be the backyard of his house out in Carcherville. In one, she was in a baby carriage, with her legs spread over the sides, pretending to drink out of an infant's bottle. The unknown that this represented was infinite. I also wondered what Mr. Macaulay wanted. He didn't say. He remarked, shifting from foot to foot, "'Now, Lynette, they tell me you like modern art.' I thought then, I think now, that the tunnel winters, the sudden darkness that April day, the years he'd had of this long green room, the knowledge that he would die and be buried Assistant Chief Engineer Grade 2 without having overtaken Chief Engineer McCreary, had simply snapped the twig, the frail matchstick in the head, that is all we have to keep us sensible. So well, that's powerful. I Number four, Railroad, a book with a significant scene that takes place on a train. Well, I refuse to talk about that hateful little novel by, uh, what's her name? Patricia Highsmith, Strangers on a Train. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to talk about uh, a novel that you will have a great deal of trouble finding if you ever try to. Have I uh, captured your interest? This one was recommended by Thomas of the wonderful book, bookish podcast, The Readers. I believe he mentioned it quite a bit last year on the podcast. The title is Victoria 430 by Cecil Roberts, published in 1937, and the last reprinting was maybe 1950 or something. So you have to track down a used copy. There's nothing available in print anymore. But he said it was one that he stumbled on in a used bookstore, and he couldn't understand why it wasn't still in print because it held up as a quite a quite a lovely novel so I paid a fair amount of money to get it a nice hardcover copy which I don't have in Japan and it's about a group of characters from all different stages of life nationalities and classes who are all heading towards Victoria Station in London to catch the 430 train heading for the European continent 13 characters in all including just for an example, a really successful novelist whose inspiration has dried up, a boy prince who's returning to his dinky little country in Eastern Europe because his father, the king, has just been assassinated, a pair of newlyweds, a Jewish movie actor returning to Berlin in 1937. Boy, was that ever a mistake. Uh, the writing is really good. I would say it's not completely a successful novel, but it, it was very enjoyable and it should be in print. Number five, Chance, a book about luck. I Last year I read a novel that not very many people talked about, and it's not a book that I've really wanted to talk about very much because it wasn't really my kind of book, but it was still, I gave it four stars because it was so well done. I just didn't like, I don't like this kind of a novel. It's called The Mirror Thief by Martin Say. I would say this is like The Da Vinci Code, but the writing isn't puke-worthy. There's three interlocking stories. One is in Renaissance Venice, the other is in 1950s California, and the third is in uh, contemporary Las Vegas, and they all kind of tie together in a way similar to the Da Vinci Code, and there's lots of gambling in the book. And that's about as interested as I am on th discoursing upon the topic of luck, but if you are interested in that, I just found it really dry. I didn't care about any of the characters, but it was really intricate and... Well done. I think for a certain type of reader, it would be a, a good book, but no, not really for me. Jail, a book where a per character goes to jail. So the obvious choice for me is Nelson Mandela's memoirs, Long Walk to Freedom, or maybe even better as a reading experience would be the biography of him called Mandela by Anthony Sampson. Everybody knows he was in prison for nearly 30 years, and um, his memoir, I, I'm i so fascinated by his life that I... I applauded through it, but it was quite a plod. He, he's not a natural writer, and he didn't get the level of editing that he needed. But if you're deeply interested in him, that's fine. But the biography, or any other biography maybe, might be better, but it's, it's really inspiring. I hope to see a lot more scholarship and popular history about 
not only his imprisonment but all the other ANCs and the transformation that they underwent. There's actually a lot available now that I haven't read. I've read a fair amount, but it's one of the most important stories of the 20th century. Do we ever need those kind of stories in the early 21st century? Oh my god. Number seven I thought was so difficult. Electric Company or Light Bulb, a book with a character who has what he or she thinks are great ideas, but are actually harebrained schemes. Oh, boy, I don't know if I can think of a one thing. And then, about ten minutes before I was finally going to make this video, it's like, aha! Harriet Dorr's novel, Stones for Ibarra. Well, my pronunciation was totally off. Harriet Dewar, I believe. And because I've been living in Japan for so long, I tend to pronounce my R's like they do in Nihongo. So the title should definitely be Stones for Ibarra, or something like that, not Ibala. This was her debut written when she was 73 years old. That's what originally drew me to I'm so interested in writers who are late bloomers. Harriet Dewar was. She wrote two more books after this, but this is her debut. And, yeah, it fits this tag perfectly. So... It's about a middle-aged American couple. I forget where in America they live, but they suddenly uproot themselves. Even though the husband has a very serious illness, they uproot themselves and they move down to the, a small Mexican town where the man's grandfather had had a copper mine, but had abandoned it a half century earlier and returned to the U.S. But this middle-aged American couple decide, even though the husband is seriously ill, to move down and reopen it. So how's that for a harebrained scheme, eh? I loved the writing. It was, had kind of a Marquesian vitality to it. A lot of eccentric characters, the local Mexican people and the husband and wife and the relations between them from a intercultural point of view, fascinating. Didn't love everything about it. There was the stuff about the nuns and priests and the way these agnostic or atheist Americans interact with them. I didn't like how those parts were written. But otherwise, I thought it was a wonderful little novel, which I highly recommend to you. Stones for Ibarra by Harriet Dewar. And she has the best author photograph ever. Look at this. Number eight, Free Parking, a book that features a traffic accident or traffic incident. The only one I could think of, and I'm happy to talk about it even though I have mentioned it a time or two before, is, I believe it's the 2016 novel The Nest by Cynthia Dupree Sweeney, which opens with a car accident. There's this rich family, and the one brother is a real Don Juan. He's a married man, but he's at somebody's wedding, and he picks up the Latino catering staff woman, takes her out for a ride even though he's high and drunk and she's giving him a hand job and he has a car accident and the latino woman is severely hurt which means that the rich family this don juan macho shithead's mother uses the trust fund that had been kept for all of the family i think it's a family of five four or five siblings and that is gone to pay off the uh, in injured woman which sets the tale in motion and for me it was i know some re people didn't like this novel and i thought it was just wonderful i thought it was quite literary and even evoked edith wharton and it all starts from that car accident the only one that's defeated me so i'm just going to turn it on its head is number nine waterworks a book with a character who cries a lot i couldn't think of any I mean, I guess because it's hard to write about crying, right? Probably characters cry in almost every novel I've read, but it doesn't sort of leave an impression. I'm instead going to talk about laughing because about a dozen years ago, I read The Brothers Karamazov, and it was at a time in my life when I had a lot going on, and I read it very slowly, late at night, a, few, a chapter here, a chapter there. And to be honest, I can remember almost nothing about it, other than that I enjoyed it. 
But what I do remember is the main character, whose name I have trouble pronouncing it, Alosha Karamazov. He's the youngest son. And I guess you could, arguably the main character. But I remember him laughing. I remember sitting up in bed at how vividly his laughter was described in this novel. And I remember thinking at the time, I don't remember ever noticing a fictional character's laugh the way Alosha's laugh is being described here. It's just like, I could hear it. It was such a deep, integral part of his character. And it was just described uh, wonderfully, and I've never forgotten it, even though I've forgotten almost everything else about that book. So I should reread The Brothers Karamazov. I happened upon this quote, and I don't know where this quote, but it's from, it's a Dostoevsky quote, whether it's from another novel or an essay or whatever, I don't know, but it kind of ties the prompt about crying together with my comments on laughing. Dostoevsky writes, if you wish to glimpse inside a human soul and get to know a man, don't bother analyzing his ways of being silent, of talking, of weeping, of seeing how much he is moved by noble ideas. You will get better results if you just watch him laugh. If he laughs well, he's a good man. All right, the next one is Hotel, a book set in a hotel. I'll just kind of gesture towards a novel that's out there that's gotten very mixed reviews and is a, a real tome, I think it's about 700 pages, called I Hotel by Karen Te Yamashita. It's gotten such mixed reviews, I'm not sure that I would ever tackle it, but I will please tell me if you think I should. But the I Hotel is short for the International Hotel, which was in San Francisco on the corner of Kearney and Jackson Street in the Manila Town, Chinatown sections of San Francisco. And it was where the tenement workers in the 1960s, mostly Chinese and Filipino men, would stay. And it was seemed to also be a center of the student and social activism of the late 1960s. And this novel is about social activism of the era. But, again, very mixed reviews. I'm interested in social activism, but it's really hard to write compelling fiction about social activism. I do also want to mention in passing uh, one of Mavis Gallant's most anthologized, most popular stories called The Muslim Wife, and it's a story set in a hotel in the south of France. It's the very first story in the mega anthology that I'm reading. It's set in about the 1930s. It's wonderful. Number 11, Rent, a book with a character who is having trouble paying their rent. I think Steve Donahue also said that it's really hard to find modern fiction that deals with you know, poor people or these kinds of issues. He's right. Uh, it did make me think of a book that I enjoyed until I started not enjoying it, so ended up bailing, called Chintu, by Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi. And the modern characters, a mother and daughter, are very poor in Uganda and having trouble paying their rent. Um, but it was around that part of the story that I started to be turned off by the novel. It just wasn't holding my interest the way the uh, more historical parts so, sent in the 18th century were. And also the classic Down and Out in Paris and London by George Orwell, which I read about a year ago. It's a somewhat fictionalized memoir about George Orwell's experience living poor in Paris and London, working, eating paper, living in horrible little rat-infested hotels, and working in hotel restaurants that once you've read the book, you might never want to eat in a restaurant again. I guess I'm glad I read it. I, once I found out that it, how fictionalized it was, it kind of turned me off because that's one of my issues with memoir. If it's memoir, don't add any fictional elements. Uh, 12. Bankrupt. A book with a character who is bankrupt in some way, financially, morally, or emotionally. Uh, morally or emotionally, I guess it would be hard to find a novel that doesn't feature such a character, hey? So I tried to limit myself to financially. And again, just like with the one people having trouble paying their rent, or somebody who's working a 9-to-5 job, it was really hard to come up with one. So I reviewed my Goodreads from 2016 and was reminded of a novel, fairly recent, I don't remember when it was published, but in the 2000s, called Marvel and a Wonder by Joe Menno, 
who's a New York State novelist, I believe. This is not a debut, I don't think, but he's not a, a well-known novelist, but I really quite enjoyed it. And the only part that really ties into this is the, the main character is a, a widower farmer in Indiana who's on the verge of bankruptcy. When I remembered the novel, when I had thought back to the novel, I didn't remember it how poor he was, but I guess that's true. But really the story is about him on his farm and he's got a drug addict daughter who barely shows up in the story at all, but she does, she has left her mixed race half black son, Quentin, who's 16 years old with the, the white grandfather. Neither the grandfather or the grandson are very talkative and the grandson has a bit of a glue sniffing problem and collects reptiles as pets and there's just not a lot of warmth between them but then somebody drops off a gorgeous racehorse in the yard one day nobody knows who but it's a gift and the grandfather can't figure out who the hell is giving me this gorgeous racehorse and they can't trace it and the story goes from there. I won't say any more than that, but it is ultimately, it's a very suspenseful and action-packed novel, but also with a lot of heartwarming stuff. In the midst of this really bleak context, this racehorse adds technicolor to the black and white uh, bleak life of this uh, grandfather and grandson. So I, I recommend that one. All right. That is the Monopoly book tag. Who am I going to tag? I think I will tag Literary Prints and Curtis Books and Films. And I'm not sure. I've got a few tags out there, and I don't want to send too many tags to the same people unless they do them, just because I think it's pressure. It's not because I'm mad that you didn't do the other tag. It's not that at all. It's just that I, I don't want the tags to pile up on your, on your doorstep, so to speak. So anybody else who's watching this, for example, here's another one. Just one reader. If you're interested, please do this tag. But it's a wonderful tag, so let's spread it around BookTube, shall we? Thanks for stopping by.